Are we stupid in America? Last month, I did an education documentary. Believe it or not, not everyone liked it. Your story about the teachers was so far from reality, it was hard to watch. I can see why unions didn't like my show. I criticized this union for protesting the testing of kids. But how do you know if they're learning anything? I know my kids are learning when I look in their eyes. Give me a break. I also attacked the unions for not firing bad teachers. Why have tenure? Most professions don't have tenure. So the teachers' unions are mad at me. But I don't care because the good news is that things are changing. Now that some kids can escape union controls, exciting things are happening. Give us the worst school anywhere in America and we'll outperform the other schools in five years. This successful educator is back tonight to explain how he does that. I love fools. How do you create a successful school? Reading and writing. It's work. Reading is work, but it's rocking awesome. That's our show tonight. When Americans hear that our public schools struggle, the natural answer is, give them more money. We don't value education in America. Teachers make a fraction of what lawyers and bankers make. We need to get our priorities straight. Fund the schools. But what people don't know is that over the past 30 years, America has tripled school funding. America now spends much more than other countries spend. Yet, what do we get? Well, we get more buildings and more assistant principals, but student learning, no improvement. Test scores are just flat. A few places do buck the trend, though, like the American Indian Charter Schools in Oakland, California. They educate the so-called at-risk kids. Most are poor enough to qualify for free government lunch. And yet, those charter schools are among the highest scoring public schools in California. Ben Chavis created the model they follow and wrote a book about his experience titled Crazy Like a Fox. Steve Brill is a serial entrepreneur. He created Court TV, some magazines, and now he's written a book about education, Class Warfare, Inside the Fight to Fix America's Schools. So, Steve, your book says that what America needs is now a grand bargain with the unions. But I can't believe that because the unions don't want any change or to fire any teachers. I think you wimped out in your research for your book. <laughs> well, no one's certainly ever accused me of that. Um, I think what we need is a grand bargain with teachers. There are 3.2 million public school teachers in this country, and it's the only workplace where uh, we don't take performance into account, as you have, as you have documented. The only way to fix the that, however... The only workplace where we don't take performance into account, meaning That's that a right. better teacher gets nothing. The only thing that counts is how long you've been breathing. And that's what the seniority system is about, and that's what the tenure system is about. But tenure how do you change that without going outside the union? You, you have to bend the union and, and tear ben up Chavis, the Ben Chavis, can you bend the unions? I didn't think they bent. <laughs> <laughs> They're stiff as a board. You well, couldn't bend them no matter how you tried. Listen, I, I don't want to be here is a defender of, of any union contract that exists today. What you have to do is take the union contract and tear it up and do a new one. There are lots and lots of teachers who care, and there are lots and lots of teachers who are embarrassed by the ridiculous positions their union takes. And those are the teachers you have to reach, and those are the teachers who have to become the leadership of those unions. Ben, you're running a few schools. What do you <sighs> think about what he says? Sounds like he, I think he would want to negotiate with the Klan. I don't know how you can negotiate with these people. I've never met the union members he's talking about. They hate competition. They hate us. Us uh, meaning? Charter schools. I don't know any union that supports charter schools. I don't know any union members. As a matter of fact, I've never, they won't come and visit your school, but they'll talk about you. They don't want us to be able to compete. They don't want my kids. For example, if you're in Oakland, if you're a charter school, they don't want you to be funded the same as the public schools. We're funded six, $7,000 less. And they say that's okay. They're only concerned with themselves. They have no interest in kids. The union has been around forever, and they, ha they have no record of showing an interest in kids. Well, well they my book documents exactly everything that Ben says. 
So I don't disagree with a word of it except the first sentence. What I'm saying is that there are certain uh, union leaders. There is a union leader in Tampa, Florida, Hillsborough County, who actually is a reformer. And well, we're going to have is, a union leader who's on this show later who's now okay. going to run a charter school. Well, there you go. So you wouldn't want to say he's disqualified because he once uh, ran the union. You wouldn't want to say that this union... No, but I would want to say County. you can't enforce your union rules exactly on everybody. Exactly right. They, you, we have no but you said that Randy Weingartner, the head of the biggest union, maybe ought to run the New York school what system. What I said was, and I said it very carefully, that if she were under the thumb of a mayor who's used to keeping his subordinates under his thumb. But why would you even include a union because leader who you, has stopped teachers from being fired? It's sort of the ultimate Nixon to China play, but again, I wouldn't give her the latitude to do what she wants. I'd say, all right, here are the policies. We're going to have accountability. We're you agree one policy for accountability means fire a teacher if you think they're not doing a good Absolutely. job? Absolutely. I mean, it, 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 it's but totally what logical. never allows that? You a say lot of unions allow that. I don't know the union he's talking about. I've never met him. And Randy, if she was in charge of New York public school system, <laughs> that's scary to me. She's only interested in protecting the teachers. Uh, you know, the old union bosses, I like them. Oh, Al Shank, those guys were right up front. We only care about the teachers. We have no interest in the kids. Kids don't pay dues. Uh, these guys, no, I do prefer the Klan over these union guys. Oh. Because, you know why? I know where I stand with those guys. These guys, they lie to you. They say, we're about the kids. All we want to do is help the kids. They don't care about the kids. Well, the fact is, I mean, that, that's nice to hear. But the fact is, that, I mean, I can't believe I'm sitting here defending the union. I mean, only, only on your show. Well, at the happen. end of your book, you sort of say we need the union. But if you go to Pittsburgh today or Tampa, Florida, you have unions that have implemented exactly the kind of reforms we're talking about. Really? Teachers don't get, you know, the they tenure we're tenure? talking about. They, they, they do not, after a very brief hearing, they're gone. You know, no okay. more, no less of a hearing than someone at Fox News would get if they weren't performing. <laughs> Seriously. I'll have to go check that, that out. Basis. Ben, I gave Steve a hard time about stuff. Let me give you a hard time a little bit. Some say we shouldn't have you on this show because you're so politically incorrect. And we did tape him saying some things that would make my neighbors around here in New York say, ooh. You can't say that. What you got to study? Science. Science? A Mexican in science? <laughs> yeah, good for you, honey. You'll be a rare bird. <laughs> so in the regular system, Ben, you, you, you know, around here you would be toast, and yet you've got this enormous success. Hey, um, I'm honest with them, and she would be a rare bird. I got six kids who are attending UC Davis this year uh, on in, engin in the engineering department, not in the ethnic studies department. Six minority kids. They're in engineering. They are rare birds, and they're they're very successful, and they're going to be successful. But of course, you know, I just say it the way I see it. And your purpose in saying that to her is what? To tell her the truth, because she's going to be hearing stuff like that. She oh, ought to hear it from you. She, I'm going to. I'm going to. When she hear, hears someone say something negative to her, she's going to laugh. She's going to say, you should have heard what my principal said in high school. And we showed earlier the union saying we shouldn't have all this standardized testing. It doesn't really measure learning. You have a different opinion. Well, I think if you do away with standardized testing, you should do away with scoring in basketball, scoring in football, uh, track. You know... It, you know, yeah, you can compare. to make how fast you run. You, you can, oh, it makes a big difference. <laughs> I know, I'm kidding. Yeah. No, I went to college on a track scholarship. <laughs> I know, that, that I would have gotten fault. out if I hadn't have been. So I'm all for testing. Testing is objective. And the reason the union is against testing is they don't want to be held accountable, as we all know. Wouldn't we love to have a job where there's no accountability? And you argue that your kids like tests. They love it. They don't like it. They love it. Be um, they love to come to school and show what they've learned. It's like playing a basketball game. Kids love the night of the basketball game because they're going to get to show all of their hard work is going to be displayed. That's why my kids love testing. My kids have the highest SAT scores in Oakland. And Steve, you, I mean, the charter schools I visited have done impressive jobs. The kids are excited about learning. But you argue in your book that these teachers are going to burn out. And I asked some charter teachers about it. But you're going to burn out. Why aren't you ticked off? That's not an option for us because we kind of have our eye on the prize with these kids. And when you see the results that we're getting, it's, yeah. it's hard to be ticked off by it. 
I mean, I can see that's what they say, they're enthusiastic, but I don't know how long they'll be enthusiastic. Listen, what I found in doing my reporting, and, and, and I love those teachers I was interviewing, is that you know, they would do it for two or three or four years, but then you know, ultimately, you know, when they get to be your age or my age or even a little bit younger, if you're answering uh, your cell phone, which you're required to do, you know, 24-7, if a parent home, has a problem, a has a question, at home, the student well, wants when homework you start help. to have kids and you start to do this for five or six or eight years, that becomes a problem. You have to be realistic about that. You have to ben, change. we're not being realistic, asking these teachers to work this hard? I totally disagree with them. It's like people who play golf. They love to play golf. My teachers, I was at the school this morning at 4.30 before I came here. I had to catch a flight in San Francisco. I was at a school. And you know that when I was leaving, there was a teacher coming in at 6. They love it. Um, They'll burn out. Do the golfers burn out? When teachers come into our school, they're first hired. They said, we've heard all these crazy things. They get there. They start working with those kids. They love it. I mean, we've got a waiting list now for kids. We've got a waiting list for teachers. People want to work with us because they know they're going to change people's lives. Teachers work 180 days a year, which is less than a half a year. Because and of summer off. They have the summer, every holiday. holiday known to mankind, we have off. So I don't know how you're going to burn <laughs> us out in 180 days when there's 365 days. We have a better vacation plan than you do. <laughs> well, well, the charter well, We're out of time, time on that note. Time. My vacation plan is, is closing in. <laughs> Thank you, Ben Chavis and Steve Brill. Next, how American public school is like this horrible car. No, no, no to Kane's 999. For years, American education, from kindergarten through high school, has been a government monopoly. People say, well, government has to run the schools. But government monopolies don't do anything well. They fail because they don't have real competition. Competition is what gives us better phones, movies, cars, everything that's good. Now, to continue this segment, I need to go briefly to Indiana. We need that kind of competition in education because when you don't have real competition, you get things like the Trabant. It was a terrible car. You had to put the oil and gas in separately and then shake the car to mix them. The car spews pollution. A man in Indiana happens to like collecting this terrible car. Since there's no gas gauge, this is checking the fuel. He owns six. When government runs things, this is what we get. In fact, this is what cars looked like when government did run the car business. The Trabant and the Yugo were the best cars the communists could produce. And yet, the commies were so proud of those cars. Trabant 601. Bequem für vier Erwachsene. Wendig. Schnell. They said they were great cars, and people there didn't know better because no competition was allowed. It's just like our public school system. Our school system, the Trabant. Now, economist Milton Friedman understood that the government school monopoly was a problem before the rest of us did. In 1955, Friedman proposed school vouchers. Instead of spending $13,000 per child on government schools, that's what America spends on average today. Instead of just giving that money to the bureaucrats and then assigning kids to schools based on where they live, he said, attach the money to the kid. Let the child and his family choose which school to attend. Then the schools would compete for that money and competition would improve all the schools. His idea was ignored for decades, but now there are voucher experiments in many states. And this year in Indiana, all low-income families can use a voucher to escape the government monopoly. Patrick Byrne now chairs the Friedman Foundation for Education Choice. And he also knows plenty about competition because he's the CEO of Overstock.com, the Internet company that buys, well, Overstock stuff that companies can't sell and resells it cheap uh, to people. And... Your point is that everybody wants choice, and that includes education? Right. Let's just remember the fundamental purpose of a monopoly. The reason business guys try to get monopolies, the whole point of getting monopoly 
is to sell an inferior product at a high price. It doesn't change anything when a monopoly happens to be owned and managed by the state, by the government. It's still in the business of delivering really an inferior product at a high price. We're spending $700 billion, this country is, on educating 50 million kids. It's $13,000, $14,000 per child. Our results are at the bottom of the industrialized world. And that's our future. If we're educating kids to the same level as, you know, uh, I don't want to name a country, but uh, Albania, say, there's no reason to think our standard of living is going to be better than them in the long run. Than Albania's? I, I hope it still is. But you argue that K-12 education is the least innovative major industry in America. Right. Because of lack of competition. Well, uh, yeah. It's, if, if somebody came from 150 years ago and went to a... M- many classrooms today, they would really recognize what's going on. There's safety in just sticking with the old system. And so it's really, you can't think of another industry in America which has been less innovative than government education. All right, so vouchers to create innovation. It is startling if you do the math. At 13,000 per kid, that means more than 200,000 per classroom. You'd think, wow, let's compete to get that money and schools would be very innovative. And yet, what if somebody says, okay, I'll take the voucher money and we'll start the Al-Qaeda school of uh, Sharia law? Right. The, well, the, the, the madrasa problem. The problem with madrasa is I'd first ask, would, would you do that? Would anyone in the audience send their child to uh, uh, the Al-Qaeda school? So why, why do you worry so much about, cho- about freedom and if people had... The, uh, the ability to choose, they would make this choice you disappear. Well, you don't think you'd have some religious fanatics who would do that, and then the taxpayer would have to help support that? Well, the, I heard Rose Friedman, Milton's bride, was once asked that, and she said, ah, oh, this country could survive a few madrasas. But I'm not, I'm not that's, a, that's a really trusted... It w- I think her point was that it wouldn't be as bad as the urban school systems we have now. Right, which are... And um, the parents want their kids to succeed in America. But I, and I actually think that the risk of parents sending their kids to some fanatic school system where they teach that the earth is flat, or they, I think that's really an overstated risk. Now, one other thing people don't like about vouchers is that it might c- perpetuate inequality. Rich people would take their voucher and have an even richer private school. Oh, that, they have it exactly backwards. I think this is the civil rights issue of the 21st century, vouchers and, and school choice. Oh, <laughs> The average private school in America, K through 8, is $5,000. The 9 through 12 is $7,000. We tend to think of private schools as being dramatically more expensive. This is what private schools charge. That's what private schools charge. So really, if the state is spending thirteen dollars or $14,000 and they just gave you a voucher for $7,000 and you, you could go out and afford... So the voucher is worth half what the state is spending on its school. So the state sp- saves money. You get more money left behind per child in the government school. So everybody in the situation is better off except, of course, the guild, the the union. One country has vouchers, Chile. And I thought it would be a big success, but they have riots now in Chile because they are so upset that some kids are taking their vouchers and going to better schools. And the protesters want to abolish all private schools. People don't like are uncomfortable with free choice. Yes, let's abolish the uh, let's abolish the Lexus and the the, the Cadillac and the and the Fords and just sell Trabants. There are always people who are going to be in favor of let's just have the government and the, the government run a monopoly and so forth. But uh, that's you know why I'm sure there were people in East Germany who didn't want to see anything but Trabants Trabants delivered. Well, thank you, Patrick Byrne. I just want to ask you one last question. What's with the suit? Is this overstock? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm going with the Chinese look these days. That This is a Maoist business suit. Do you like it? Yes, I will say yes. Um, <laughs> thank you, Patrick Byrne. Next, we meet a guy who went from being an anti-charter school union boss to running a charter school. How is that possible? Union leaders tend to hate charter schools. Newark's union boss told me, over my dead body, they're going to come to my schools. So I was surprised to learn about A.J. Duffy. He likes to be called just Duffy. 
He used to be the boss of the powerful Los Angeles Teachers Union, but now he's the boss, or will be soon, of a charter school. So how can you go from trashing charter schools to running one? Well, it's a matter of circumstances. Um, the background is, very quickly, uh, there were a group of teachers at a defunct uh, charter school uh, who called me and said their principals and their executive directors uh, cracked open the state standardized tests and handed it to them and said, you will create lesson plans based upon this. And they said, absolutely not. So they called me and they said, what, what can we do? We're at will employees. I said, come on down, let's talk. And we unionized them. So through that process, I got to know these teachers, almost 73 of them. And then we try to keep the, the schools open because I am the president of the second largest teachers union or was, and my job is to keep my teachers working. So we tried to keep the schools open, but it became clear that the management of those charter schools were not to the liking of the school board, and that was a good thing because they were corrupt. Uh, the schools closed down. We started talking about re-employing the teachers, and they needed somebody to run the place. This Apple Academy is going to allow us to do things in a completely different way for the students. For instance, I heard you talking about how bad tenure was. I think tenure is a good thing, and my teachers will have tenure, but it'll be earned tenure through recertification programs. Let me finish, John. Through recertification programs that every couple of years, under the direction of a master teacher and a principal, they will have to recertify. Each time they do, they will get a little more tenure, now, it sounds you add, endless. You add recertification programs to quality professional development, and you have teachers who are constantly involved in getting better at their craft, getting better at teaching. What if they're not? What if they're all, lousy? It's you call, it's, all, we got apples because you say it's, it's the all Apple Academy. Student centered. What if there's a bad apple? If they've got tenure, you can't uh, say, sorry, let's get rid of the bad apples. Yes, you apples. can. In California, the charter school uh, setup is you can get rid of ineffective teachers. And they say that and in New York, will. too. This is what we it's required, all these steps to get rid of a not tenured in, teacher in New in York. Not at the charter school. Well, not at the charter school. So you'll be able to fire, you'll be able to say, sorry, Apple. Yes, yes. Will we do that? In one fell swoop, no, we're going to bring in our own peer assistance and review program. We're going to have teachers helping teachers, but if we find teachers are ineffective and they're not helping the students, then we're going to fire them. That's I would totally. assume I any feel bad for the kids. Who's I guilty think. of doing something immoral or illegal, they're gone. Well, that's good to know. <laughs> But I feel bad for the kids because I assume your school will not perform well. You know, in New York, there's one, the teachers union said, oh, we're going to have choice of charters? Well, we'll run one. It's one of the worst. You know, I have the opportunity at the end of my career to show the world that progressive charter school management... And teachers at the local school site who are unionized can work together for what's best for the kids. Now, the teachers that we'll be hiring are pretty much from the old school, and their academic performance index, which is California's way of judging schools, was through the ceiling. There is no reason to believe that it will be any less quality for the students in that community. Well, I hope you do it and prove me wrong and succeed for the kids. Duffy, thank you for joining us here today. Later, I'll show you some very cool things that are already happening because of school choice. But next, the audience will have Itze. When they get to We're back now with your questions for my guests. They are Ben Chavis of the American Indian Charter Schools, Patrick Byrne of the Friedman Foundation for Education Choice, and former union boss from Los Angeles, A.J. Duffy. But first, I want to ask the audience something. How many of you went to public schools, or government schools as I like to call them? How many of you got a good education at those schools? Most of you. But I would argue that without real competition, you don't know what you might have had. You don't know that it was a good education. You might have gotten a Trabant and thought you got a good education, just like the Russians or the East Germans thought they had a good car. 
right? So I just want to plant that idea in your head since most of you think you got a good education in government-run schools. But let me go to your questions. Yes, sir. Shouldn't we at least consider selling our public schools and making them private? And uh, with the high technology that we have now, shouldn't the cost of an education be going down instead of up? Not in America. We spend more money, it costs more to educate a, cow, a child per year, or a cow, than it does to incarcerate anyone. It costs $50,000 a year in California to incarcerate a person. In Oakland, California, it's $18,000 a year. Well, you only spend six and a half hours a day in school per hour. It's cheaper to have someone in prison. Who's next? Yes, sir. Historian Will Durant stated that liberty and equality are lifelong and everlasting enemies. Was he right or wrong? Liberty and equality are enemies. Duffy? I don't think so. I mean... But the Think union stands for equality, right? Every teacher gets paid the same. Is public education perfect? Far from it. But are there uh, oases of excellence that exist within public education? Are you going to pay Absolutely. good teachers more at your school? We're going to pay our teachers more and train them better. But some teachers more than work, others? And have them work together to create quality education for the students that we will serve. That sounds like boilerplate. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's a yes or no question. You're going to pay it's some not, teachers more than others? It's not really boilerplate. We're going to pay our teachers a fair and equitable salary. And that's what teachers really want. And do what's this right This sounds like students. union gobbledygook to me. Are you going to pay a good teacher more than another teacher or everybody gets paid the same? Everybody at the beginning will certainly get paid the same. Later, and will some get a raise and others not? I have no problem looking at those. But it becomes a matter of what's the standard we're using? to judge what's a better teacher. What we're going to do at Apple is You're the is boss. Build, you can just decide. You know, you know what? This is going to be a teacher-driven school, student-centered. Parents will be a part of what we do. And we're going to build something at Apple Academy that's never happened before. I cannot tell you whether a good teacher is going to get paid more because I don't know what the standard is. We're going to create that standard. Wait a minute, we'll wait a minute, Mr. Duffy. The standard is the American Indian model. We're the number one school in California. We're the standard. You're going to have to whip us now. Every black in Oakland, California who passed AP calculus came from my school. 30 some other high schools, not one passed. And you pay teachers different amounts and fire well, teachers I quickly? sure do. He, he, you know, it's when you, once you open your school, Apple, you'll. It's easy to talk about what you're going to do, but when you have a lousy teacher, you'll get them out. You get them out in one day. One day. You said. The teachers who teach great. I got a Mr. Isaac Berniker. Seventy-nine percent of his students pass the AP calculus. Every senior in our high school takes AP calculus. He gets paid very well. The one who was teaching physics, that Mexican's gone. <laughs> A Mexican, I'm Indian. Married to a like my kids are half Mexican. That don't make no difference to me. He had to go. The Hebrew got to stay because he's doing a great job. Am I racist? No. Yes. No. He did a great job. Statistics. 79%. The other guy. But what does it matter if he's a Mexican or not? You are racist. I am. He's a lazy. He made us look bad. He cheated my kids. He cheated our kids. Their minority, he wants to talk about, oh, I'm for the kids. He wasn't for the kids. They didn't pass the class. Why are we always training the teachers? They spent five years in a university. They come to work for me, and I'm supposed to train them. In our school, we don't train the teachers. We train the kids. I think it's a waste of money if a person went to UC Berkeley for five years, and then you come to work for me, and I have to train you again. You should get a refund from Berkeley. <laughs> Why are you talking about need, training teachers? teachers? What about need, training kids? Teachers need constant training. Teachers I need to look at data all the time. Teachers need to look at the student population they're dealing with. And that can change from year to year to year. Teachers need quality professional development. That is absolutely, I disagree with that. I think that's, the, I think that's the that. guild protecting itself. I think that that is Stossel, not the guild. The guild doesn't the run the professional development. You the guild helps craft the professional development to meet the needs of classroom teachers so that they John can Stossel meet the needs of students. John Stossel couldn't go 
to a public high school and teach journalism because you don't have the guild certificate. So they wouldn't be allowed to. You wouldn't be allowed to. So you're so that's the guild protecting itself. He would need to go through training. Yeah. <laughs> Who's next? Right. Here? Yes. <laughs> Why is it that we treat uh, teachers with such kid gloves? You know, we worry about them burning out. We were about them, you know, working long hours. I mean, the school day ends at, what, 2.30? We were about them, you know, they don't work in the summer. Why is it that we treat teachers so differently than any other profession? I'm not sure. I do know But you agree with them? I, I'm going to answer in my way, John. <laughs> <laughs> I do know that clearly what's going on now is that education is changing, and that's a good thing. And maybe it'll come to pass that teachers do work longer. But you know, as well as I do, that there are a lot of teachers out there that work more than just their six hours a day. They grade papers. They do a lot of extra work. Hell, when I was a teacher, I was in the community tutoring in the inner city. Yes, sir. If there's a lack of innovation in um, public education today, then why don't we abolish the, the Department of Education that sets a very specific curriculum? Doesn't, isn't that really the antithesis of innovation? May I hit that one? Hit, hit it out of the park there. Um, uh, we've been and I'm with you. Let's abolish uh, first the of all, we federal should, department. The, but it's not, we shouldn't stop there. You know, a lot of people have been talking about the union tonight. It's not just the union. The problem is, I think, deeply embedded in, this, in the district, county, state, and federal. It's like the There's old... There's even a name for this resistance, right? The blob. The blob. I call it the guild. You call it the blob. It's, it's this all, old Soviet agricultural system. The school boards, the PTAs, the educrats, the professional educators, and the union, Duffy. And you, po you point out that on Indian reservations there's no union, but there's still a blob. Yes. I, I, I'm not obsessed with the union myself. I don't have any problem with the union. I think it's the school board. If you get rid of the school board, who is elected by the union, they schedule elections where they can control the school board. At the university, we have unions... But we have one school board for the whole state. I'd like to go to one school board for the whole state of California. That would castrate the union. Okay. And the, the blob. You've heard the phrase, the blob? Yes, the educrats, the, the blob. I, you used the show two week, in your show two weeks ago. Yeah, Jabba the Hutt is the good image that I can think of. And I, I felt this dealing with... Randy Weingarten, the head of the union, protesting my show. Teach, John, teach, he said. You teach for a week. See what it's like. And I surprised her by saying, okay, I will. Then they had 400 meetings. Months later, they couldn't even agree on finding me a classroom in which to teach. It's like you, they don't say no. They just say yes, and then you, they smother you in bureaucracy. They want and that's training. how you some training, John. Yeah, that's and that's how teacher training. unions have evolved to where they are now. Not fighting the community, not fighting parents, but fighting school district bureaucracies that are stuck on stupid. Now, clearly, clearly, teacher unions have to evolve, and I think there are places in the country where they are evolving. And it's happening in, in significant ways, but it has to happen more. The problem is, it's the incentive of the union and the blob not to evolve. So we can stay, sit and talk about how much we want it to evolve. It's in their economic incentive not to evolve. Their incentive is to fence off and protect the monopoly so they can t continue to serve a... Uh, you know, a bad product at and a it's high only price. competition that changes that. Well, it's right. an overstock. I All this change. cheap stuff it's that you get. Hang cheap. on, Duffy. Cheap. Yeah, I assume it's overstock. It must be cheap. It's None of those great. companies wanted to sell it to you cheaply. Uh, maybe we they were forced to because it wasn't doing well. The incentives. It's all about the incentives. Yeah. Until you get competition, it's just going to be in the incentive of the blob to slow down reform, to keep anything from changing so they can keep extracting monopoly rents. Thank you all for spending time with us today. Coming up, we'll introduce you to someone who says school choice saved his life. Do vouchers for education work? You bet they do. Just ask the low-income kids in Washington, D.C. who got vouchers to attend private schools. The Department of Education found that after three years, the voucher kids were a year ahead of the other kids in reading. 
So, what the politicians do? Expand the voucher program? No. Two years ago, they killed it. Why? The president's press secretary had trouble answering that question. The president has concerns about uh, uh, concerns about uh, taking uh, large amounts of funding out of the system uh, to. Um, After the cancellation, there were protests. President Barack Obama, you say that getting an education is the key to success. But why do you sit there and let my education and others be taken away? Yeah, why? Did you ever get an answer? But before you respond, let me explain to our audience who you are, that you were the high school student making that speech. Ronald Holassi got a voucher six years ago that allowed him to escape the terrible D.C. public school system. Now he's a freshman at Barry University in Miami. So what happened? Did the president ever respond? Well, I really don't know where the program got reauthorized, so... Kind so of, maybe he heard, actually it, it was authorized against his wishes. He got bullied into it by the Speaker of the House, and after it was reauthorized, he said the administration opposes the creation or expansion of private school voucher programs. The federal government should focus its attention and resources on improving the quality of public schools for all students. What do you say to that? Well, why would you... I understand that you want to focus your attention on improving the public school system, but what are you going to do about the students that are in failing schools now? What, what are they going to do? You're going to leave them there to suffer? No, they've we been need promising to fix it. Exactly, but we need action now, and that's why we have the DC Opportunity Scholarship Program. So and that's why you I got were in the before you got your Opportunity Scholarship through a lottery. You were lucky to get it. You were in the public schools, and there was a big difference? Huge difference. Academically, um, also with safety, that was a big issue back in the public school system when I was in there. There were lots of fights? Yes, lots of fights. Um, there were shootings, stabbings, and it, it was really unsafe drugs. You had to get to... My, my mother, basically, she wanted me out of that environment. She wanted to put me in something that was totally different, which w she wouldn't have to worry. But she didn't have the... Of thirteen thousand yeah, dollars that, at that they spent. No, the she didn't have it. She just didn't have it. The opportunity scholarship was was much less than that. It was just seven thousand. Yes, yeah, seven thousand five hundred at the time. But that was enough to get you into a Catholic school that was just much better. Yeah, it got me into uh, Archbishop Carroll High School. And what 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 did you notice? What was the difference? Academically, I was I, I was actually challenged academically. I remember when I was in the public school system, my teacher left in the middle of the year, and I remember doing crossword puzzles and stuff like that. Just I, we we weren't teachers actually learning. Didn't care? Really? They didn't care. He didn't. He did not. The teacher that I had would, did not even care that they so called put in as a teacher. In that cl in the classroom, even us students, fifth grade, fifth sixth graders, were complaining about it. That experience really set me back. And your mother, who's from Trinidad, was going to send you to Trinidad, where they actually have good schools. They do well compared to the American schools. Yeah, they test. do. They do. She, my mom, my mom, she got to the point that she was really fed up with the system, the public school system, and was really tired of it. And her only option was sending me back to Trinidad to go to school and get an education. That's how she felt. She wasn't going to continue to just let this system fail me. She, she wasn't going to let that happen. But you did get the voucher. You were lucky. You've gotten a good education. You're in college. And despite the data showing that the kids are ahead in reading who went to this, through, who got the voucher, the biggest union, the NEA, says the D.C. voucher program has been a failure. It's yielded no evidence of positive impact on student achievement. How is it a failure when the public school system is failing students? It is failing its students. How can you say that a voucher program is a failure? I don't understand that. I don't understand don't that either. Understand. We have some data on graduation rates, if we can put that up. I look at the D.C. public schools, 49% graduation rate. Now, we put voucher losers and winners on this graph because perhaps people like your mother who apply for the voucher are a different group, but 
that's a pretty basic study. The ones who got the voucher, 70% graduate versus 91% of the voucher winners, 99% of the kids from your high school, they do better. They do, and, and it's, it's proven. It's, it's proven. It really is. And I should say we asked the NEA to say, how can you say this? And they didn't call us back. Hmm. Well, I'm glad it's worked out for you. Yeah. Ronald, thank you for joining us today. Ronald Holassi. Next, some more good news. Some very exciting things are finally happening in classrooms. The world is changing fast. For years, the blob, the horrible job of the hut like suffocating, mostly unionized bureaucracy, has controlled our school system and imprisoned kids in terrible schools. They had a stranglehold on education. Just six years ago, when I first did a Stupid in America show, unions were so outraged that someone would dare challenge their rules and say competition would be better that hundreds of them showed up outside my office to scream at me. Stassel, shame on you. Educators all over the country feel that they have been kicked in the teeth. She was upset that I called K-12 through education a government monopoly and said monopolies don't serve their customers well. I don't think she'd even heard the system called a monopoly at the time. When I interviewed her about it, she replied, people who say that don't like children. And yet now, just a few years later, lots of people call the current system a government monopoly. And millions of kids get to escape it via charter schools or vouchers. 18 school districts now have more than 20% of their kids enrolled in charter schools. Six have more than 30%. And when Hurricane Katrina destroyed much of New Orleans, the city replaced most of its schools with non-union charters. All this happened in just five years. Homeschooling is up, too, all around America, and the results are good. The homeschoolers outperform the government school kids on SAT tests and ACT tests. So do many of the charter school kids. Not all. But the beauty of charters and private schools is that when they don't do a good job, they die. They go out of business. The bad government monopoly schools never went out of business. This new competition has led to promising innovation, too. More kids now learn on computers. Think about this. 200 years ago, most towns had one best singer. You were stuck with that singer. But then came radio and records and CDs and now the Internet. And thanks to that, the best singers now reach the whole world. Certainly, there's a best teacher, too, or several now those teachers via the internet can reach the whole world up until now the blob has slowed that progress but that's changing too at this california school students learn from one of those internet teachers the local teachers resisted the change at first but now they're excited about it because the kids are excited to learn they love it they're happy to walk in the door every morning they're excited about math it isn't oh we're doing math it's like oh my gosh we have math this morning that's great and I visited charter schools in Harlem where I was surprised to meet kids who want to go to school and are so poised and confident that they gave me a hard time when I said things like this. School is boring. No, it's not. It's not. My school was boring. That charter school's on to something. I don't presume to say that they have the answer to know what learning method will prove to be the best. But the beauty of competition is that none of us needs to know. The best methods emerge through competition. And when that happens, a thousand flowers will bloom. And I bet most of them will be better than what we've got now. That's our show. Thanks for watching. Good night.